All right, so just reiterating for the camera, um, all of the links are now posted on jordanhayashi.com slash bootcamp. And as we go, I'll just keep adding any relevant links up there. So let's kick off where we ended yes, a couple hours ago, an hour ago, with JavaScript closures. So closures are like the one thing where if you ask any like JavaScript programmer, what's the hardest thing about JavaScript? And they'll say, closures for sure. So, <clears throat> but now that you know everything about lexical environment and stuff like that, it's really not too bad. Essentially what it means is that functions can refer to variables that were declared by their parent function, even after that parent function returns. And so that's because of lexical scoping. Um, and so let's take a look at that in code. So for here, um, All right. Um, <clears throat> so as we learned in lexical scoping, uh, child functions have access to anything that was declared by their parent. So let's go ahead and write this function <coughs> that makes another function. So call it make hello function. And from within it, we're going to create a variable um, and call it message and say hello world. And then also within there, we're going to declare another function called log message. And all it does is it console.logs message. And then we're going to go ahead and return the log message function. And <coughs> so now we have this function. And so within, oh, let me fix the lights. So within uh, the make hello function, we're creating a variable called message, and we're using that variable within a new function and returning that function. And so within log message, nowhere is message actually defined. And yet if we do this, that will run this function. It will declare the variable called message, it will create the function called log message, and then it'll return the message, the function log message. And so what do you think would happen if we just ran say hello? What would your instinct say? Yeah, so that's what will actually happen. But a lot of people would look at that and say, hey, it'll run this function called console log message. Message is not defined on the global scope, and it will error. But um, because of lexical scoping, uh, the message is still around. And so how does this work on the actual call stack? So let's take a look at what actually happens behind the hood. <clears throat> so never do we touch the browser APIs or the function queue. But what happens is we run a uh, make hello function, which adds itself to the call stack. Um, which then creates a variable called message. And it creates a function called log message, which is returned. which is turned and stored here. So this is called, what do you call it? Say hello. Then what happens? The function returns, right? So it gets wiped off the call stack. But not everything actually disappears, because this is still in memory somewhere, right? 
And because we still store a reference it in say hello, when say hello is called, it actually still has a reference to that parent's variable. <coughs> and that is called a closure because this remembers any references from its parent and wraps it up in a closure. And so because this still has a reference, the garbage collector is not going to free that memory and it'll stick around until you need it for as long as you need it. Does that make sense why that works? Uh -huh. And log message didn't reference message, but the function within log message did. Would that work yep. as well? Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, so let's look at this in practice. So first, let's just make sure that Jordan's not crazy and see if this works. And it does. Um, so now let's look at another example. An example that... It's a bug that happens a lot, and like if you go on Stack Overflow, I guarantee you an active question right now probably has this bug. Um, so let's do this. All right, <clears throat> so this looks vaguely similar to the example before, right? So we have a function that creates a, an array, pushes to the array five times, console log i, returns that array, and then we store that array in a variable called functions. So what do you think will happen if we invoke these functions? So let's run functions uh, zero, just invoke that. So what do you think happens here? What will print out? Zero. So let's, let's draw this out on the board. So we have make function array is called. And it creates an array. And then and then what does it create next? A variable called i, right? So this is make. functions array, it creates an array, empty array, and a variable called i. And then while i is less than 5, essentially, uh, push to that array console log i. So we have console log i here. Um, adds that a few times, increments i. And then does everybody agree with me that this is the state at the end? We have array that's filled up with a bunch of functions uh, that just console log i. We have a variable i, which is what value? 5. And then anything else? No, so it returns that array, right? So we have an array called functions. Um, and then what happens? Yeah, it gets popped off the stack. That sticks around, right? And then when we run the first function, it's console log i. So it's an anonymous function that does console log i. And what's it referencing? That closure, right? So 
So what, with that information, what should it print? Five. So five. And so that is very, very unexpected behavior, and it causes a lot of bugs in a lot of JavaScript programs. Because a lot of people will just run through this array and run each of these ones, right? Like. So this will say just invoke every single one of the functions. And it prints out five every single time, which is really strange. And a lot of people are get really tripped up on that. And if you just think about why this happened in lexical scope, then it makes sense. Right? Does, is there anybody who's like, that doesn't make sense at all? So we're all on the same page that it, this is how JavaScript functions. And it's not unexpected behavior. But how in the heck do we fix that? Let's find out. So we use what are called immediately invoked function expressions, um, or IIFE, or IFE for short. Um, and it's a function that expression that gets invoked immediately. Um, and it creates a closure. And the way that we do that the reason that we do that is because it doesn't actually add to or modify the global object. And so you can run this code and be safe that it's not going to change any previous values that you have. <coughs> and also it creates the closure, which is why we're going to use it to solve this problem. And so what does an iffy look like? Um, uh, I wrote one a little bit earlier today and told you guys to ignore it, but now it's time to actually look into why this happens or what it does. And so let's just write an anonymous function that does console.log high. All right, and if we run this code, what's going to happen? Anyone? Yeah? Is that a hand? It just calls the log high. You run that. So if we run this as is, it'll actually, it'll error. Well, even if we try it, how, so the question is, how would we call this function? Because there's no way to, because it doesn't have a name. It's just a, an anonymous function sitting there. It'd be like just writing one, right? Like, that's not really a line of code that works. It doesn't do anything. And so the, the, JavaScript engine will actually complain like, hey, this is just a random statement and it's not doing anything. Actually throw a syntax error. <coughs> and so the, the way to get around that is to put it in parentheses because within parentheses, they create expressions. And so like if you just have this, that's just a number. It doesn't do anything. But if you then wrap it in parentheses, it's now an expression that you can put in like an if condition or a while loop, or anything like that. But you can't do like while one in JavaScript, because um, you need an expression there, not a statement. And so in order to make this uh, actual an expression, we can just kind of cheat that and wrap it in parentheses. And so now it works. It's just there. It doesn't do anything. And we can actually invoke it immediately um, by saying, how do you run a function? What do you do? parentheses. And so if we do that, that is, so it's a function that we create on the fly, an anonymous function that just is there, and then we immediately invoke it. And so this does what? It just says hi. Does that make sense theoretically? And so why the heck would we use this? <coughs> um, if you look at frameworks, they'll actually always wrap up your entire framework in an iffy because it, any variables that you use won't be in scope, right? Because what is the scope of a variable? What's the lifetime of a variable? Yeah, so when it starts until the function ends. And so if we wrap it up in a function and we do something like this, this function dies at line 7. Whereas if this were just a normal anonymous function that we call later, it's possible that 
it'll leak into the global scope. Um, and so that's one reason for testing and stuff like that. But the other reason, the big reason, and the main reason, is because it will actually wrap things up in a closure. Um, so let, I'll just write some code, and then we'll talk about it in a second. So actually, let's... Um, Let's copy that closure that we're working on. Um, and let's fix this code. So right now, we know why this doesn't work, right? Because I just keeps getting overwritten. And then when the console logs get run at the end, they're still referencing that same variable i, which is now changed. And so how would we do this? Well, we turn this function here. So let's give ourselves a little more space here. So now it's a little bit easier to see this function. Um, and then we're going to create an uh, iffy closure around it. And so I'm just going to write some stuff. So that should work. Um, so does anybody see what I did there? Let's see a couple of head nods, a few confused looks. So essentially, we have a function, an anonymous function, that returns another anonymous function. And that second anonymous function, the child function, just console logs i, which should be x. So console logs x. What is x? Well, let's look at its parent. Its parent is a function that takes a parameter called x, and then we take that in the child and print it out. And so do you, do you see why that creates now a parent with a child, where the child still has reference to the parent? But the parent is now reinvoked at each iteration of this loop with a new variable. And because primitives pass by value rather than passing by reference, it actually creates a new value for every single iteration of that function and creates a closure around both the parent and child functions. So let's, let's do this on the board. <clears throat> Use a little more space. So do you want me to redo the original closure where it didn't work, or are you okay with why that didn't work? Does anybody want me to redo it? Okay, let's redo it. So so on the left here, we have the original one. Um, and so first thing that happens is we have our global. Is this too low? Can everyone see? OK. So we have our global execution context. And then we immediately invoke this make function array, which creates two things. It creates an array. And then the next line, line 4 for var, var i equals 0, it creates a variable called i. Um, and then starts pushing to that array. And so let's keep track of the array over here. So first we have a function that returns console log i. OK. So index 0, we have function. I'm going to use squiggle notation just because it's easier to write. Does everyone agree that's what happens after line 5 for the first time? And then what happens? So I was 0. Now what happens? Yeah, I gets incremented. 
then what? Is i less than 5? Yes, it is. So go ahead and push a function, an anonymous function, that does console log i. All right, so. All right, now i is 2. And then we keep doing this until i is 5. And by then we have... So a bunch of console log i's, and then what happens? Array gets returned, and so now it lives here. And then what happens? We pop this off the stack, right? And so make f array's gone, array's gone. Is i gone? No, because it still has active references, right? These all reference i, and so the garbage collector will not take it away. So that's still there in memory. And then what happens? We're now at line 14. Line 15 is, I'll change it back to what it was. So function zero, <coughs> so we throw that up here. We'll run function zero, which is this anonymous function here. And so we run that, so console log i. Which is referencing what variable? This space in memory here, what is its current value? Five, so it'll print five. And same with all of the other other ones. Yeah. Why wouldn't the array when it's being created like it would, it would store console dot log one or console log two or console log, console dot log zero? Like why doesn't it, re it doesn't re it replace i with the the value of i? Because isn't that how we expect functions to work? Like if the, i is kind of like in a higher scope than than this function. Um. Like if you do var i var x. Mm -hmm. Don't you, don't you, isn't x5, like when you... Uh, if it were purely synchronous, yes. If it were to return x plus x, the function would just return 10 always, like it would back to x. Um, if you're purely synchronous... No, it'll, it'll store a reference um, because of that lexical scoping. Um, so take this for example, like... what we'll print here. Yeah. Um, because it's storing x, because of the, because of the closure, it's kind of a circular reasoning, but because of this closure, it's storing that reference to its parent function's value. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's why it's... So why, so wait, what's the difference between, like, display C or something and JavaScript that makes it... has block scoping. Yeah, so C has block scoping and JavaScript has lexical scoping. Okay. So, are, are there other languages that have lexical scoping too? That you would run into this problem with? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I can look it up for you, though. Um, but it is weird. It's very weird. And that's why a lot of people who are just starting JavaScript programming run into this exact problem, including myself and including like nearly every single person who assumed this behavior is as it would be in most other languages. Um, but thankfully we have closures which will solve this problem. And so on the right over here we have this make function array which successfully fixes the problem. Um, so let's go ahead and walk through why. Right, 
So most people would argue that it's not a problem, it's a feature. Um, <laughs> I'm tempted to answer with closures, but um, I can look into a, other people's opinion. I'll, I'll look it up because that's okay. a good question. I just kind of took it for granted. I'm like, well, I have no say in the matter, so I'll figure it out. But I'll, I'll look into why. Why? Okay. All right. So let's let's look into this second example, which supposedly successfully fixes the problem. I haven't yet verified if my code works, but maybe we should do that. Oh, no, it doesn't work. Um, oh, <laughs> good call. Oh, no. Missing parentheses after argument list. Oh. This is closed. Does anybody see the syntax error? Oh, there should be no comma there, or semicolon there. So I added a, a semicolon there, even though we're within the push function, so that's why it was wrong. And there we go. So it, it does work, um, and we'll go through exactly why. So it's the one on the right here. <coughs> and so let's start walking through the steps. Um, so same thing, we have that make function array call. And then we have array. Which now point to this. We have i. Which gets initialized to 0. And then we hit line 5. So array push this thing. And what do we push? It's an iffy, right? And what do iffies do? They invoke the function, right? Which means you pop another thing in the stack. It's an anonymous function that takes a single variable. So it's just anonymous. Uh, but it takes a single variable called x. So it has x over here. x gets past what value? i, which is what value? Zero. Zero. And then it returns a function that console logs x. So now we have a function that console logs X, and specifically this X. And then what happens? It returns. But because there's a closure referencing this X, not everything goes away. The X still stays there, right? And then what happens? I gets incremented. And then we start all over again. So what happens now? We had a new stack frame, right? So it's a whole new stack frame, and it creates a whole new execution context, gets a new this, even though it still references the same this. Um, and it has all, all of its properties on it as well. So this is another anonymous array, another anonymous function, um, which has its own x, different than this x, right? Because it's a whole new stack. And that gets 1. And then you return the console log of this x, 
So these x's are not the same x, because this x is actually referencing this spot in memory. <coughs> and then we repeat that. Does that make sense? It's weird. It's very weird. I agree with you, it's very weird. Um, and I'm curious why it's there. But I'll look into it. But does everybody understand, like, immediately invoked ifies? Do you understand ifies? And do you, do you see how this, by doing an ify, it creates a new stack frame, which then creates that closure? Because this console.log is wrapped up with that x. So that's a closure there. And this is also a closure. Does that make sense? How each new one creates its own closure. It's mind-boggling, but you'll get used to it. Yeah? To fix a closure? It used to be. It used to be one of the only ways. So another way would be you could create a new variable here. Um, and so if you have a new variable here and it's referencing a new variable, then you could do that. Um, and with, um, <coughs> with ES6, um, you can do that very easily. So with ES6, uh, it introduces block scoped variables. Um, which means you have, from this parentheses to the clothing parentheses, you can create a variable whose lifetime is only of that length. And that's with the keyword let. Let x equal i. And then we can replace i with x. And that, that creates a closure. So with ES6, it's much easier. Um, it's actually even easier. Um, with four each loops. And it doesn't really apply to this one. You could do this. Um, and then do whatever the push you want there, and that will also create a closure. <coughs> and so this new for each that's added to the array prototype creates a closure for each of the loops. Um, and so that will do it. That's the easiest way to do it. The downside of that is it's very, very slow compared to um, doing it with the manual iteration with a for loop. But with ES6, closures are becoming less and less of a issue feature because like, they give you ways to do it very easily. Uh, any questions of any of the JavaScript topics so far? Yeah? So why is it closure like, Yeah, so it's essentially, it's using a variable that should be out of scope. Um, okay. Like this, this parent function already is gone. It no longer exists. It ran and it, it died but its child still has access to all of its variables. Oh, okay. <coughs> um, and actually, there are a few closures in... Um, there are a few closures here, right? Um, callback here. This callback, that's not within the scope of the user compare password function, right? It's not passed into it. It's never declared anywhere, yet we can still return callback and pass it something, even though it's only in the scope of its parent. Even down here, this should be callback. Uh, callback here, like, in nowhere in this function is callback defined. Nowhere in its parent function is callback defined. Nowhere in its punk, uh, parent is callback um defined. Only in its parents, 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 parent is callback actually defined. But because of the closure, we can still use that variable down here. So it sneaks up on you. You'll, you'll use it without even realizing. Just because you're thinking like, hey, I'm writing code down here. It looks like I'm in with the, within this function, so I should have access to this variable. 
And because of lexical scoping, you do. So maybe that answers the question. Because it gives you access to these even after these functions are all done running. Does that make sense? So like if you're if you didn't know that this was asynchronous and you're just reading it, you're like, okay, I see why we can use this variable because it's within this scope. Any questions thus far? Yeah. <coughs> so it give, it creates um, these new constructs. Like let did not exist in ES5. Like if you said let x equals this, they would be like let like that's a syntax error. Um, for each was not part of the array prototype in ES5, which was 2014's version, but with ES six, which I believe was 2015, um, it introduced those new constructs. So let for each Any other questions? And so the reason I'm actually teaching closures and stuff is because not every browser has fully implemented the ES6 standard. And so if you're writing front-end code, you need to make sure it works for that. Um, if you're running it on like your backend and node, you know that every single time this function ever runs, you're in this node environment. And if your node version supports let, which um, 6.9.2 or whatever we're running does, um, then you can go ahead and use let, you can use for each, you can use these arrow functions, and a lot of the ES6 functionality. <coughs> There's also transpilers like Babel, which will take ES6 code and transpile, meaning um, write it for you in the ES5 standard. Um, and so that was one of the technologies I mentioned that we're not going to be using just because we don't have time to go into. But I'm a strong proponent of knowing why this works, being able to use this, and then only once you understand it, do you then say, okay, I'm comfortable moving to the ES6 standard because I know exactly like what errors I could have introduced otherwise. All right, if there are no more questions, that pretty much concludes JavaScript, the language. We learned pretty much everything there was to it. Um, so yeah, there are courses that take like weeks that cover what we did in one day. So <laughs> good job, guys. Um, and tomorrow we'll move into Express, but for the rest of today, um, I'm going to cover Git. Uh, who's used Git before? Quite a few of you. Um, who feels comfortable using Git? Oh, wow. Okay, <laughs> nice. Um, so you guys will be able to kick back for a little bit. Um, and I'm just going to introduce Git and what it's used for and why we use it and how it can save your lives or cause you to pull your hair out. So... Git. So what is Git? Um, if you look on this man page, it's the stupid content tracker. Um, and it's just a very, very popular version control system. What does that mean? It means it allows you to create checkpoints within your code and be able to revert back to other checkpoints. Or maybe create alternate realities and say, oh, is this reality better or is this reality better? And if the other one's better, just go with that reality. And then be able to hop back and forth with any single checkpoint you've ever made. Um, and so it'll track all that for you. Um, you can also use it to synchronize code between other people. Say you're working on this part and he's working on this part. And you're like, all right, let's combine our code. It'll automatically, or at least try to, automatically merge everything that you've both done together. Um, I didn't finish that sentence. You can also create alternate branches that can. Uh, <laughs> but that branches are the alternate realities that I touched on. Um, and so it's easy to get lost in Git's expansive functionality because there is a lot of it. Um, if you look at the man pages, it's like pages, pages long to explain to you the commands that you can use and then each command has its own like pages worth of commands. And so you could work with Git for years and still not know half of what it does, which I can attest to. Um, but there are a few uh, commands that everyone knows and everyone should know. And starting with git init. And what it does, it creates a git repository in a current directory. Um, behind the hood, what it does is it creates a .git folder in your current working directory, uh, which is any folder that is prepended with git, or any file that, not git, but any folder or file that's prepended with a dot is hidden from the user. Um, and so it doesn't show up if you're looking in Finder, it doesn't show up at ls, 
But if you do something like um, if we do git init, it says initialize empty git repository in this um, working directory. And if you do ls, you don't see anything. If you open the folder, you see that it looks empty. But if you do ls-all, you see this .git. And so that is where all of your everything is stored. Um, if you don't want to create your own uh, repository, you can go ahead and clone somebody else's. <coughs> and so the code for that is git clone, um, and then you give it a URL. And it will copy that git repository located, located there into your current working directory in a new folder. And so it includes all the files, it includes all the history, it includes all the branches. Um, or you can create a fork on GitHub, which actually pretty much steals it. It'll say, hey, I'm initializing this new repository and I am the owner. Whereas if you just clone it, the other person is still the owner. And git status uh, shows the current state of a repository, it displays any changed files, added files, removed files. Um, so let's look at a couple examples of these. <coughs> um, let's look in so get status so this is my the code from the website that has the bootcamp stuff up on it um, and if I do a get status I can see that my branch is up to date with production master what does that mean I'll tell you in a little bit and it shows you essentially the status of everything. Um, so I have recently modified this file. I've also recently created this file. Um, FYI, that's essentially what a git status does. And say I want to clone this repository, I can do this um, git, git clone. Oh. Nice. And so it finds this URL and goes and gets all of the stuff there. And it'll actually clone it into my own whatever folder I'm in. And so I apparently have a lot of stuff up there. And it will download and it'll say, here's the entire repo. And I'll be able to see all of the commits I've made previously, any branches that I have, and anything like that. Um, Wow, it's actually ridiculously large. <laughs> it's like a gigabyte. Um, <laughs> all right, so this one has a lot less in it. And you can see I created this thing called coupon API over here, which is we'll start looking into that code tomorrow. And if you see, there's already some files there. I can check git status. And it's like, I'm up to date, clearly, because I haven't done anything. Nothing to commit, working directory clean. Um, and so that's an example of just cloning a repo, and you can start to work all, right away. Um, git add path. And so once you start working, how do you tell git, hey, I want to save this file in my next checkout, or next um, checkpoint? And so you use this git add um, command, and you give it a path, or multiple paths. And it says, hey, git, keep track of this file at its current state, and then when I next commit, then store its state. Uh, if you modify the files after adding them, then git will remember what state they were in when you added them um, with that command. Uh, and if you accidentally add files, you can uh, reset them not actually like revert them, but just take them out of the tracking by using this git reset command. And all it does is just resets, undoes git add, uh, and removes files from the index, which is tracking the difference between uh, your working directory and any commits that you've made. <coughs> um, there are other commands that you can use with reset. Um, you can reset soft, reset hard to a commit, which means restore the state of your repository to a specified commit. 
Um, and so soft means don't change any of my files. If you do dash dash hard, that means like delete any, any progress that I've made. And be careful because this is like one of the very few commands where if you run it without intending to, you're screwed and you cannot get your changes back. Um, so very, be wary every time you use git reset hard because you might lose everything since your last commit. Um, so we could look at what this looks like. So, we, so if I were to change stuff, um, so let's just make something. Uh, so we did touch A, which creates a new uh, file called A. And if you see A is there, and then if we do git status, what is it going to say? Hey, you have a new file. It's untracked because git hasn't seen it before, but it's just there in your directory. And so you can say, hey, in the next commit, I want to add that. And you can say git add the file A, which says in the future, like for the next commit, A exists, and I want you to keep track of its state. And so if you do git status again, it now says changes to, to be committed. There's a new file called A. Um, but let's actually start writing something in A. Hi, this is a line. Git status. So when we added A, what did it have in it? Nothing, right? It was just a blank file, and so over here it says a new file. And since we added it, it we've changed it, right? So it says changes not staged for our next commit is A. So since you've added it, you've changed it. Even though you haven't committed anything, I still remember where it was when you added me. And so you can run git add again, and you're now up to date. At least the changes, all the changes that you've made are being tracked. <coughs> Make sense? And so what if I did, um, what if I didn't want to add A? I'm like, uh-oh, I didn't mean to create that file. I didn't mean to add it. You can just do git reset. Um, and if you look at your git status, it's still, it's now an untracked file. Because remember, as of the last commit, A didn't exist, and now it does exist. So it's a new file that's untracked. Git doesn't know what it is. Um, but did we actually change anything? Yeah, so everything that we wrote in there is still there. So by doing git reset, we didn't actually revert anything. So is git reset soft by default? It's different. So doing git reset um, pulls things out of the index. So the index is the technical term for the stages, um, things that are staged for the next commit. Um, and so git reset with a path just removes something from the index. Whereas git reset, reset soft is actually a different command. It's kind of an overloaded command where it does different things depending on what you pass it. So if you pass it soft in a commit, it'll actually revert the working tree, I guess, to a previous commit, meaning it thinks it's at a different commit, but all the changes you've made since that last commit are there. So it'll be like, hey, you did a lot of work since this last commit. Whereas git reset hard will forcibly change all of the files to be there. And so it will delete any changes that you've made. But anything that it doesn't see, it won't touch. Like if it's not being tracked, it won't actually affect that file. <coughs> Um, git commit, um, so this is the, like possibly the most important command, um, and it creates a new checkpoint in your project along with a message. Um, it stores the state of any of the added files that you created, so anything that you added to the index with git add will be saved into that commit. But you can use the dash a flag to automatically add all of the files that git already knows about. Um, so you had to have added it in a previous commit. So if we did something like this, so right now we have the status git has never heard of A, right? We never ran git A, git add A, um, and it hasn't been in the repo since the last commit just because I just added it. And if I did git commit dash A, it'll say there are no files, nothing added to commit. Why? Because A, git doesn't know about A. It doesn't know that it's supposed to be tracking A. And so when you do git uh, commit dash A, which is all, it doesn't know about A, um, which is a little bit powerful because you can store files in a git repo that never get pushed to the file, get pushed to the, re the um, 
remote repository. So like I keep a to-do list for the projects that I work on, and so I know like, oh, after I finish this, I should work on this function or add this functionality. But I don't really want to push that to my repo, and so I can just keep it in my um, local repository and never add it, and so Git will never track it. So even if I did a git commit dash a, it won't add my to-do list. It'll only add the files that it's currently actively tracking, which means files that it's already been added to. 